Taking big swings is honestly what the NBA is all about. If you want to achieve any kind of success at the highest level, there are a small number of examples of teams doing so by being conservative. If you just look at most of the recent NBA champions, you see teams like the Lakers who took a big swing by trading a huge package away for Anthony Davis, the Raptors who went out and traded for Kawhi Leonard, the Bucks who went out and traded for Drew Holiday, the Warriors obviously brought in Kevin Durant to solidify their dynasty, and many others. These kinds of moves have set the tone for championship contention in the league, but what you have to realize is that timing is everything and you have to take these kinds of swings on players that actually fit. This brings us to the topic of today's video, where we'll be discussing the current state of affairs for the Minnesota Timberwolves and how they have hit rock bottom by missing on that whole timing and fit point that I just mentioned. We'll be going over what got them to this point, where they went wrong, and why the mistakes they made were mistakes in the first place. Before we start though, make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel, as all support is very much appreciated. Now with that being said, let's Let's begin. To start off, we all know the Timberwolves as a franchise that hasn't exactly had much success over the last decade. Since 2005, they have just two playoff appearances, including last season, so when they finally made that breakthrough, they, rightfully might I add, thought that it was a good time to get aggressive and pursue an acquisition that can move the needle. Carl Anthony Towns has been one of the most talented offensive players in the NBA for years now, Anthony Edwards showed major promise as a wing scorer in his second season, D'Angelo Russell has been an all-star caliber player for much of his career, but yet they barely snuck into the postseason last year and needed something big to take them over the top. They were a top 10 team offensively last season, ranking 7th overall on that end, but were much more mediocre on the defensive end, ranking 13th in that regard last season, so naturally with all of the offensive firepower that they already had at their disposal, their focus turned towards finding a defensive anchor that could solidify that end of the floor for them, but this very mindset actually ended up setting them back years. Of course, as you all know already, Rudy Gobert also happened to be having a falling out of his own with the Utah Jazz and had become available via trade for the right price at the same time. This is a player who has won Defensive Player of the Year three times, he consistently ranks near or at the top of most defensive advanced metrics, and he's as good of a rim protector as it gets. These two timelines overlapping seemed like a match made in heaven, and of course the Wolves did go out and make that blockbuster trade to get him, but it was never going to be that simple. There is, of course, a reason why Gobert and the Jazz eventually had a falling out in the first place. For how good Gobert is on defense protecting the paint, his game is by no means perfect. The Jazz were consistently a playoff team during his tenure, and a few years were picked by some to make a deep run because of the talent they had, but in the postseason, Gobert has notoriously been figured out, and when the Jazz have been eliminated, it had typically been done because their opposition figured figured out ways to neutralize him. The Rockets during the James Harden days used to run him through the rinse cycle, forcing him into pick and roll after pick and roll, having him defend in space constantly, and switching him on to smaller perimeter players to get him out of the paint. The Clippers then used a similar strategy by running five out lineups to get Gobert out of the paint, which resulted in a barrage of three pointers for them, because Gobert tried his hardest to sag off to maintain his paint presence, and most importantly, his relationship with Donovan Mitchell fizzled out by the end, and their rocky relationship had been under the microscope in the media over the course of their final few years together until it eventually did fizzle out. Now, I know it feels like I'm being harsh on Gobert, so I do want to say that I'm definitely not pinning all of the Jazz's issues on him, because the team also had perimeter defense problems as well, which made his life even tougher. But he was still contributing to the problems, and offensively, he's not a player that impacts that side of the ball, as the Jazz were able to maintain the same exact offensive rating of 117 with Gobert both on the court and on the bench. 
In the words of Donovan Mitchell himself, he recently said in an interview that, quote unquote, honestly, basketball just didn't work. Basketball just didn't work. We didn't see eye to eye. We wanted to both win, but we wanted to do it two different ways. It didn't work. He of course said that about his pairing with Rudy Gobert. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to read between the lines in that quote. Their play styles just did not mesh. So now, to tie that back into his current situation, let's go back to the trade that brought him to Minnesota in the first place. The deal saw the Wolves give up five players, including Patrick Beverly, Malik Beasley, Jared Vanderbilt, who are all playing valuable minutes on other teams right now, along with four first round picks and a first round pick swap. The Wolves emptied their treasure chest of assets to bring Gobert in, and when you do that, it literally has to be a move that puts you over the top. If you pay that hefty of a price and mortgage your future that significantly, you better be doing so for a player that makes you one of the favorites to win the championship. Spoiler alert, this trade did not at all make the Timberwolves championship contenders. Right now, the team has a record of 17 wins and 21 losses and sit in 11th place in the Western Conference standings. So not only did the trade fail to elevate them, but they have actually somehow taken a step backward to this point and after a loss to the Detroit Pistons, who have the worst record in basketball right now a few days ago, they officially have hit rock bottom. Bottom. Before the season even began, I expressed my concerns with this team for a variety of reasons, and while I'm not trying to I told you so, you guys, I kind of did tell you so. Among the things that concerned me before the year was that the Twin Towers lineup featuring Gobert and Carl Anthony Towns would push Towns to the power forward spot full time, which, for an already lackluster defender, is just going to expose his deficiencies on that end even further, as he will be defending forwards more often now. Sure, they're bringing in a defensive anchor, but his place throws the rest of the things off. The fit just is not there. Additionally, we'd be lying to ourselves if we tried to say that Anthony Edwards and Donovan Mitchell don't have similar play styles, so if Mitchell and Gobert couldn't get on the same page, then expecting Gobert and Edwards to was always going to be wishful thinking. Right now, the Timberwolves rank as the 20th best offense after ranking 7th best last year, and they rank as the 14th best defense after being ranked 13th last year, so they have gone backwards on both ends of the floor. There is no denying it, this is as bad as it gets for a team in year one of going all in with no other alternatives. A lot of this video has been spent talking about how bad the Rudy Gobert trade has been, but again, he's not the only issue with this team. To put it simply, they more often than not just struggle to play with heart. D'Angelo Russell is a former all-star talent who, to be blunt, has been a disaster this year. His defensive effort has been abysmal, his decision making in big moments has been poor, and the team has performed better with him on the bench, according to net rating. Overall, they play a pretty selfish brand of basketball, and the lack of accountability they take adds insult to injury to their fans. After that embarrassing loss to the Pistons, backup center Nas Reed was interviewed, and when he was asked about why the team is underachieving, he said, We know, we know why, and you know, I'm gonna kind of keep that in-house, but we know why. I don't know about you, but it sounds to me like there's already turmoil in that locker room. There aren't any leaders that stick out on this team, their vets don't set the tone like the vets of other teams do, there's a lot of selfishness happening, and on top of all of that, the players just don't fit together. The Timberwolves literally need them to figure out how to make it work, because there really aren't many other options. They gave away all of their draft picks to form this core of players. They have minimal cap space moving forward because of the Gobert and Towns contracts, along with the impending payday that Anthony Edwards is going to be getting soon, and they're not a destination that usually attracts free agents. It's a harsh truth, but it needs to be said. The Minnesota Timberwolves are maybe in the worst situation in the NBA right now. And with that being said though, that's all I have for you today. Make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and comment down below what you think the biggest issue is with the Timberwolves right now. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time.